Rich, ruthless, and famous, my guest is a New York institution known for the buildings he's built and the wives he's divorced. You don't want to cross him, though, because he likes getting even. And he's made it a rule that no one pushes him around, ever. So how did he lose all his money and then get it back again? Donald Trump, a very warm welcome to the program. You say you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. That sounds like a very destructive business philosophy, is it? Well, I'm not sure that I've actually used those words, but generally you have to shake things up pretty, pretty much in order to do something of consequence. And I have shaken things up, and I've had the best business years of my life by far. How rough is business in New York? We hear a lot about it's the toughest, the roughest, the most ruthless business in the world, is it? Well, I think that business in New York tends to be tougher maybe than other places, but I'm not so sure that's true. Uh, the real estate business in New York is, is an amazing business. It's a great business. And anytime you have a great business, you always have competition, and you always have, unfortunately, the smart and the tough people coming into it. You have to be a killer in business? I think you have to be smart in business. I don't think you have to be a killer. I think you have to be smart. Does that mean eyes in the back of your head, always looking to see who's going to get you, who's trying to pull one off, a fast one on you? Well, one of the things I say in the book, and I say very strongly, is you have to be paranoid. Uh, and the book is selling so well, and I guess people believe this, but uh, there is a certain advantage to having a certain degree of paranoia. Uh, you watch, you can be a little bit careful, uh, you watch what's happening behind your back, and I think that's probably very true in business. If you're paranoid, how much enjoyment is there? I mean, how much time do you have to actually sit back and say, look what I've done, this I, is great? I think that uh, there's great enjoyment. I, I think that the paranoia cannot be carried to a life-shattering crisis point. But I think it's good to always know that people are out there, and they're looking, and they're looking to throw you off your throne. But um, I think success brings great enjoyment, and certainly it has for me. Is it? The competition that fires you up? Is it the money? What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? What is it that drives you here? I really think it's the artistic or the aesthetic. I love building great buildings. In the case, most of my business is the building of things. And I get, I get great artistic pride out of a great building like Trump Tower, which is on 57th Street and 5th Avenue in New York, or Trump International Hotel and Tower, my new building on Central Park West. I mean, I get a great sense of artistic enjoyment out of those buildings. What do you think of, of business methods in this city? I mean, you've, you've been a New Yorker all your life. You've lived here. What do you think of the way people conduct business in this city? Well, I don't think that New York is that much different from other places. What I do think is that there's a greater energy in New York. There's a greater verve or a greater drive, maybe, in New York than most other places, and really than any other place I've seen. But I don't think that business itself is much different in New York than it would be anywhere else. Greed, corruption, I mean, you say it's a throwaway line in the book, greed is good. Well, I don't think greed is good. And uh, as you know, they did the famous film where, with Michael Douglas, Wall Street, where greed is good. But that is not the case. I mean, I think greed is bad. I think that you have to enjoy what you're doing. If you enjoy what you're doing, it'll be successful, generally. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, it's almost never going to be successful. Rich men are always targets. The richer you get, I suppose, the bigger the target that you present to people. How much does that worry you? Well, I think that rich men, um, I guess, are always targets. Rich people are always targets. And I think that there's a level of celebrity that I've attained, which has become so ridiculous now that it makes me an even bigger target. So it always bothers me, but there's really not much I can do about it. I mean, R I can't Ridiculous help it. in what way, the celebrity level? Well, it's, it's just become very tough to go out. It's very tough to do things. It's very tough to just even go to a restaurant, in a sense, because it's always shaking hands and signing autographs and things. And, you know, it didn't used to be that way. But that's a symbol of success, is it? You're it is, a but it's, of it's, your own success. It's not necessarily a good symbol. It's really, um, it causes lots of problems. I mean, you, you go out and you want to have dinner at a restaurant with a group of people, and it ends up being a big event, and you have people waiting at the entrance to the. It, it's just a very tough way to lead a life, I find. You talk in your book about getting even, the importance of getting even. Is, is revenge sweet? 
I believe strongly in getting even. If somebody has hurt you, if somebody's gone out of their way to hurt you, I think that if you have the opportunity, you should certainly go out of your way to do a number on them. And I've had more criticism about that one statement in my book than any other statement. The clergy is called, the ministers, the priests, the rabbis, they've all said, what a terrible thing to say. That's against our teachings. I just believe it. I believe in an eye for an eye. If you did turn the other cheek, as the clergy are presumably suggesting to you, what would that do to your reputation in business circles here in New York? Do you think? Well, I don't know what it would do to my reputation. I just don't believe instinctively in turning the other cheek. If somebody was out to hurt you, if somebody was out to do a number on you, I really believe that you should just do a number on them if you get the chance. Can you give me an example? Well, there were people that I really helped in business when things were very good in the 1980s and when my company was going good. and they did not lift a finger to help me when I needed it. And there were a couple of them that could have very easily helped me. Now I have the opportunity to do a number on those people, and I will tell you I'm having a lot of fun with the opportunity. Who are the movers and shakers in the society? We, we get the impression in New York that power is in the hands of a few very, very rich people, yourself included. Um, decisions in smoke-filled rooms, is that still the way business is conducted in the city? Well, I think New York is very much run politically. I think we have a mayor that's named Rudy Giuliani who's done an incredible job in New York. He's, and just got reelected. And just got reelected by a huge margin, I guess the largest margin ever. He has been an incredible mayor. He's done an unbelievable job. And he's just been great. And he, so it sort of, it starts off with the mayor, the leadership, and the politicians. Um, we have uh, other people within the business community, obviously, that are very important, and there are a lot of them. But the city has just become very, very hot, and I think it's due to Rudy and lots of people in business that have done a very good job. When you say hot, it more focused? It's really become focused. It's just a place where everyone wants to be. People want to come to New York. They love the city. They want to be here. They want the action. You know, New York has action. New York is unbelievable action and everyone wants to be here. And I happen to be the biggest developer in New York. My company now is doing much better than it ever did in the 1980s. I mean, What do you so. attribute that to? Well, I think one thing is perseverance. I mean, when things were tough at the beginning of the 90s for me and everyone else, the problem with me is I was getting all the publicity. The I Great Depression, was, you call it. I call it, the, I call it the Great Depression of the early 90s because we were act, really in a real estate depression. And it was real estate and retailing and airlines and various other businesses. They were in a total depression. They weren't in a recession. And I survived. Most people didn't survive. I mean, a lot of my friends, a lot of good people and bad people had to go bankrupt. And you know, never heard from them again. And you probably never will hear from them again. But you know, I survived to a point where the company is much bigger now than it ever was and much stronger financially than it ever was. And I wrote a book about it. But in the early 90s, you faced the possibility of losing everything. In fact, on paper, you had lost pretty much everything. I had faced the possibility of losing everything. And it, I went back to work. I focused. I focused my mental energies and all of my energies. You never thought of giving up? No. I, I think one of the reasons I really succeeded, and bigger than even in the 80s, is the fact that it's, it's a little word called perseverance. I didn't stop. It's quite um, a long word, actually. It's a long word, come to think of it. But I didn't stop. And I, I did persevere. I went against a lot of odds. And I came up with a phrase, survive till 95. That was in the early 1990s. And it turned out to be right, because the world changed, the economy changed, and there was a survival tactic till a certain year. And in 1995, things started changing. But I, I mean, it really started changing for me almost right at the beginning, because I went back to work. I refocused my energies. How and desperate I, were you at that time? Well, and how depressed did you get? Well, to start off with, I really blame myself a little bit because I've always been able to pick markets. And I really wasn't focused toward the end of the 80s because I was having too good a time. I was enjoying my life too much. Things were going too well. You dropped your guard. I did drop my guard. And it's no different than you if you do 15 great interviews. You know, you sort of, on the 16th, you can take it easy because, well, that happens in life. That's a human trait. And I did drop my guard. And what I did is I re-put up my guard and re-put up my defenses and my offenses much stronger than I ever did in the 80s and worked probably harder than I did in the 70s and 80s and actually became much more successful. You had to believe in your own abilities. Wasn't there a time when you thought, I really can't hack it, I should get out of this? I'm well, not, there was I'm not a, suited to this. 
There were some pretty depressing times because I had owed billions and billions of dollars. Nine hundred and seventy-five million or so was personally guaranteed, and that's a pretty deep hole. And when you're that deep in debt, you're mired in debt, and you're that deep in debt. I mean, that's a pretty rough situation to be in. And the vultures are circling around you. Well, you had plenty of vultures. You had plenty of bad people circling, and some good people that, frankly, wanted to get paid, but. Uh, it was just, it was hunker down time, as they say in Georgia, and I, I did do that. Did you learn some lessons about the people who were your friends and the people who weren't your friends? I wrote painful once. Painful lessons. They were painful, and I wrote once that I would love to sort of have a bad period financially, just to see who my friends would be and who my enemies would be. Now, I'll never write it again, because it's not fun. But and it I, might be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, well, I, that's true. And so I don't want to write it again. I wrote it once, and I had that down period. And that down period, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. But I will tell you, I also learned that there are some very good friends out there for me, and there were some people that did not help. Tell me about the women in your life, because there seems a sense in which you, you say in the book you've measured women by, by your mother. Well, I have a wonderful mother, a great mother, and I, I don't say I measure women by my mother, but I have a woman in my mother who's, who's a terrific woman. Um, and I've been married to two very nice women, but it just didn't work out. And, and I think part of that, one of the negatives to success is that there are lots of obstacles thrown in your way in terms of relationship. First of all, time but even your own mental psyche. I mean, my thing is I'm thinking about deals and I'm thinking about these great buildings all over and, you know, that I'm doing and uh, I'm building the largest job ever approved by the New York City Planning Commission on the West Side. You know, that's a thought process. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm doing and building. And I'm thinking about that maybe as opposed to relationship. I'm not saying that in a positive way. I'm saying it almost in a negative way because it's very negative in terms of relationship. And success may be great in terms of living and lifestyle and beautiful homes and apartments and boats and planes and all of the stuff that doesn't mean very much. But success is not necessarily very good for a relationship. Women are far stronger than men, you say. Do you really believe that? I believe that women are actually stronger than men. And I actually say that they're not so much stronger, but I think they're more aggressive than men. And their sex drive makes us look like babies. I think that the women. women's sex drive is actually as good or greater than a men's sex drive. And I, and I mean, I've been witness to it, and perhaps you have if you're lucky. But, <laughs> but sex drive of women is extraordinary. And they like to portray themselves as the weaker sex, but the weaker sex doesn't exist, believe me. I, I think they probably, they're certainly the more aggressive sex. And even in business, I found that some women are just more aggressive. And I don't exactly know why. And I say this with respect. I don't say this with scorn, with anything else. I say this out of great respect. But uh, I think that women, in many cases, are more aggressive than men. You've seen that sex drive firsthand. You talk about the woman of great social pedigree uh, and, the, and the dinner party that you went to. Tell me about that. Well, I've had, I've had a lot of circumstances where uh, a woman's sexual drive has turned out to be just extraordinary. And not necessarily anticipated by me. And I write about this in the book, and it's pretty good stuff. I this mean, this was really a specific a dinner, though, wasn't it? This was a were... specific dinner. And, and, and What happened? Well, I'd rather let the book speak to it, because to be honest, it's almost embarrassing talking about it in, a, uh, in an interview. But because it really is mostly a business book, but I think that women have a lot to do with business. They have a lot to do with the effect on your life and how they affect your life. They have a huge amount to do with it. She embarrassed you, though, this woman. I mean, you don't name her in the book, but she I embarrassed you. I don't know. I would you. never name her. Uh, somebody else wrote a book and named all the women that he had, as he said, conquered. And I it was playing with the feet under the table, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and it was a whole thing. And it led to something that was sort of interesting. And it just wasn't a very good thing, especially with her husband's